Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights, and Engagement Committee on November 18th, 2019. My name is Philippe Cunningham, and I am the chair of this committee. With me at the dais are Council Member Schrader, Johnson, and Council Vice President Jenkins. Please let the record reflect that we have a quorum and can conduct the business of this committee. Colleagues, we have 13 items on today's agenda one presentation as well as three public hearings. I will go ahead and uh, we'll go through the consent agenda, approve that as well, and then followed by the presentation, and then we will move to the public hearings. So on the consent agenda, item number four is approving two council appointments to the Transgender Equity Council. Item number five is accepting a grant in the amount of $13,260 from the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority for an intern salary and other expenses to develop a dashboard that will display the health data of, health of high rise residents in Minneapolis. Item number six is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health in the amount of $120,000 to implement culturally appropriate immunization outreach within the Somali community for a three year period. Item number seven is authorizing the Minneapolis City Council in its capacity as a community health board to execute a master grant contract with the Minnesota Department of Health for health services for five years. Item number eight is authorizing two contracts for community solar garden agreements. Items number nine, under item number nine is authorizing a contract practicum experience agreement with Bethel University School of nursing for their students to receive internship experience through the school based clinics program. Item number 10 is setting a public hearing for December 2nd, 2019 to consider an ordinance amending Title 15, Chapter 399 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances related to offenses, uh, mini excuse me, miscellaneous uh, control of invasive species tree pests, adding and amending provisions related to the removal of trees subject to invasive species infestation. Item number 11 is setting public hearings for setting a public hearing for December 2nd, 2019 for five appointments to the Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights. Item number 12 and item number 12 on the consent agenda is setting a public hearing for December 2nd to consider an ordinance that will essentially locate existing environmental fees, amending various provisions to refer to the new chapter and update to ensure compliance with state laws, law changes for accuracy and clarity. I move approval of all of these items. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Our first item for discussion today, or our item for discussion today, is receiving and filing a presentation on the Child Friendly Cities Initiative. The presentation will be given by the Health Department's Commissioner, Commissioner Gretchen Musicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the Child Friendly Cities Initiative, something that I had not heard of until last. Uh, May. Um, but the Child Friendly Cities uh, Initiative has been around for quite some time across the globe. It was initiated to create, well, initiated to create <clears throat> cities um, that are safe, inclusive, and child responsive cities. It was launched by UNICEF in 1996 as a declaration that the well being of children is the ultimate indicator of a healthy habitat a democratic society and good governance. Something we're gonna experience a little bit later today here in this committee. A Child Friendly Cities initiative has reached up to 30 million children in 38 countries. There are none of these cities in the United States, which is maybe why I hadn't ever heard of it. So um, the 30th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is November 20th, so this week. And so it's appropriate that we are talking about this at that time, at this time. So um, as part of uh, creating the Child Friendly Cities Initiative, five goals, a handful of goals were established. 
and these are enshrined in the rights of the child. One is that every child and young person is valued, respected, and treated fairly within their communities and by local authorities. Secondly, every child and young person has their voice, needs, and priorities heard and taken into account in public law, policies, budgets, programs, and decisions that affect us. Our own Youth Congress has as their theme, no decision about us without us. Every child and young person has access to quality, essential social services. Every child and young person lives in a safe, secure, and clean environment. And every child and young person has opportunities to enjoy family life, play, and leisure. So there was a convening, and it says Jackson on the, on the uh, PowerPoint, but it was Jacksonville, Florida. Um, this past summer in May, and I was invited to attend and did out of curiosity, a small group of Minneapolis delegates, um, other interested people also attended. And uh, as a result of the two days of learning about what this initiative is, we really came away feeling that Minneapolis is in a state of high readiness to become one of the first child-friendly city, cities in the United States. Some of the reasons that we're so ready is we have the Youth Coordinating Board, this multi-jurisdictional group that has always been that has been focused for more than 20 years on the well-being of young people in our community. We have the Youth Congress, so we have the ch the youth voice, um, not only heard episodically but as a as an institution of our city. We've established the Minneapolis Youth Cabinet, which are people who represent the various departments in the city who come together and think about young people and the impact of our policies on young people. And the Youth Coordinating Board is fin currently finishing up a youth master plan, which lays out some directions for us based on the input of young people. We've also had youth-focused Results Minneapolis um, sessions. Uh, we've certainly heard youth voice in policy decisions like tobacco um, at the ordinance level and at the community level, Rethink Your Drink, youth are leading us there. We have a really robust youth employment program and Step Up, and <clears throat> our stable homes, stable schools is really a representation of us working in the sphere of housing, thinking about young people and their education and well-being. So one of the first things um, that uh, UNICEF would like us to do is to have um, a stakeholder group. And so when I came back from Jacksonville, we pulled together a group of um, local community folks who are interested in this, along with staff from the YCB, staff from the health department to begin to talk about, is this a reasonable idea? Um, should we bring this forward? Should we start talking about it? One of the expectations was to um, complete what turned out to be a nine page, 19 strategy questionnaire about what's going on here in Minneapolis. And lo and behold, we were able to say yes to just about everything on this list. Really um, impressed ourselves to pull all this work together that's occurring across the schools, the youth coordinating board, the health department, other parts of the enterprise. And we have met with a UNICEF representative who also was quite impressed with the work and the state we are in as we start this consideration. So the next steps to becoming a child-friendly city are to create some formal commitment um, in partnership with UNICEF. Uh, they have a memorandum of understanding that they are just pulling together. We're really considered one of the pilots of this because they don't have a process laid out because they've never had any child-friendly cities in the United States. And so as, as we emerge into thinking about this, they are also emerging into thinking about what's the process. But we believe that there will be a memorandum of understanding that could happen fairly quickly. And then once we have done that, we'll need to build out a multi-sector task force and think more deliberatively about how we lean into this notion of being a child-friendly city. So their cycle includes uh, having an MOU with UNICEF, really doing a child rights situational analysis that we've begun to look at here, 
and which our youth master plan is a part of. Uh, then creating an action plan out of the information that we pretty much already have and beginning implementation. Uh, at that point then there would be some monitoring and evaluation and at some point it might take a year or two actual recognition of us being a child friendly city. But my goal is to be one of the first MOU cities at least. Not that I'm competitive. Sometimes I am. Um, so um, our situational analysis that we need to do um, is really going to be based on our youth master plan already. And so I've been already working with the UNICEF folks to remind them that we are not starting from scratch. And so all their uh, really helpful ideas of how to get started if you've done nothing um, is, is good. But I don't want them to think that we are at that point. I want them to understand that we are 90 some percent of the way there and that we can build on the work we've already done and go further. So then um, <clears throat> we will need to develop an action plan and so that will be a result of looking at our youth master plan, some of the data that's been collected from young people. Um, building a community around child rights awareness. Now that's an area I don't think we are as familiar with as you would find across the globe. Um, people are not as familiar with the rights kind of focus looking at young people and so there's room for that. We've had already conversations with some of the instructors in the Minneapolis Public Schools. There's interest in expanding that the work that they're doing and so we have potential. Um, child friendly governance, certainly um, we are in the process, the Youth Coordinating Board is in the process of creating a children's budget and um, we look to their leadership to help with that. And finally, we have a lot of strength with our Youth Congress, but the uh, Child Friendly City Initiative also wants us to be more engaged with younger children and so I think there's a potential for working with neighborhoods or schools or daycares to begin to think about what kind of um, voices haven't we heard yet from younger children. So as I said, Mark, uh, November 20th marks the 30th anniversary of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child <clears throat> and is also World Children's Day and so we're just two days away from that. In the 1990s, we believe, and I'm going to say it that way uh, because we haven't seen the document, but we've seen it written about, um, that Minneapolis Mayor Fraser formally supported the Convention on the Rights of the Child, perhaps with a proclamation. And we believe that Minneapolis is well poised to become one of the first U.S. child friendly cities. And so uh, I believe that uh, Councilmember Cunningham, Mr. Chair, you have a resolution that will move us in that direction. Great, thank you. And is that the end of your presentation? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and I just want to welcome Council Member Gordon and also just let it be known that I am competitive, so I want to be the first city. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, I will um, actually read out the resolution uh, so that my colleagues know, and then we will uh, go ahead and take action on the two items underneath this presentation. So, oh, and actually I just want to check. The United States has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of it was the Children's Rights of the Child. Correct. So, um, and it's been 30 years. We supported it under the Clinton administration in 1995, uh, but we have not ratified it. And it's largely due to our criminal justice system because kids under 18 are able to be uh, jailed or imprisoned without parole and also be um, con confined to solitary confinement. So um, our criminal justice system actually is the reason why we have not yet ratified it. So I just wanted to make sure that that was still the case. So thank you for that additional Yes, uh, Council Member Cunningham, um, I believe the U.S. and Somalia are the only two countries that have not ratified. That is correct. That's what I saw too. South Sudan also had it, but then they did when they got their government back in order. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, so the resolution pursuing a child-friendly city designation in accordance with the five overall goals enshrined in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child 
whereas the Child Friendly Cities Initiative was launched in 1996 to respond to the challenges of realizing the rights of children in an increasingly urbanized and decentralized world, and whereas the Child Friendly Cities Initiative works by bringing together local stakeholders and the United Nations International Child's Emergen Children's Emergency Fund, UNICEF, to create inclusive and child responsive cities and communities, and whereas the importance of cities in policymaking that directly affects children has increased, and whereas local governments and mayors have a role to play in supporting and advocating for the most vulnerable in their municipalities, including children and young people, and whereas the Child Friendly Cities Initiative has been instrumental in encouraging local governments and other stakeholders to pay greater attention to meeting the needs the rights and needs of their youngest citizens and ensuring their participation in local decision making. And whereas children have the right to be valued, respected, and treated fairly. And whereas children have the right to be heard. And whereas children have the right to social services. And whereas children have the right to be safe. And whereas children have the right to family, family life, play, and leisure. And whereas November 20th marks the 30th anniversary of the UN Convention of the, on the Rights of the Child, now therefore let it be resolved by the City Council of the City of Minneapolis that the Minneapolis City Council affirms Mayor Fraser's support of the Convention of the Rights of the Child and pursue a child-friendly designation through UNICEF USA, and let it be further resolved that the Minneapolis City Council direct staff to implement necessary steps to become one of the first child-friendly cities in the US. Thank you for that. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Cunningham and Ms. Musicant. Um, and equally as competitive and would love to see us um, uh, be the first city to to protect young people. And as you noted in your opening remarks that we will be taking a, yet another step to protect young people in our community uh, later this, this afternoon. But I'm just wondering what role does um, the elimination of poverty play in this um, conversation and if there isn't necessarily uh, language around that at the UN, is it possible we could name that in our memorandum of understanding? Yeah. Um, Eliminating sure, sure poverty, running, not yes. promoting poverty. Yes. But, yeah. Council Member Jenkins. Um, the rights of the child, I think, has like 39 items in it. So I'd have to look to make sure um, how poverty has been addressed specifically in there. But I think the notion of poverty underpins part of the rationale for um, the whole convention, which is to say that young people need the kinds of um, infrastructure and support, meaning food and clothing and schooling and shelter um, in order to to thrive. And so it's, um, I think, very reasonable to expect that, that poverty is embedded there and also a reasonable, I think, to pull it out and, and raise it up and, and name it as part of our action. Thank you, Council Vice President. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, thank you so much, Commissioner. I'm excited about this work and really grateful to be able to be part partnering with you to be able to carry it forward. So with that, I will move receiving appro approval of receiving and filing the presentation on Child Friendly Cities Initiative, as well as approving the passage of a res the resolution affirming the city support of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and to pursue this designation through UNICEF USA and to direct staff to implement necessary steps to become one of the first child-friendly cities in the United States. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. All right, and now we will be moving to our public hearings. We have three public hearings today. Um, the first is going to be on conver a conversion therapy 
ordinance. Item number two is the green to go ordinance. And item number three is carry out bags in retail establishments. So we'll go ahead and kick off our presentation. Welcome track and the floor is yours. Thank you, oh, that was loud. Chair Cunningham, Council Vice President Jenkins and committee members. My name is Track Trachtenberg, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the Trans Equity Project Coordinator in the Division of Race and Equity. I'm here with a coalition of a number of internal and community partners to introduce the ordinances that will ban conversion therapy, update our city's definitions of gender and sexuality, and amend the administrative enforcement and hearing processes. Many, but certainly not all, of our enterprise and external partners are listed on this slide, and we want to extend a major thank you to everyone who has contributed their expertise to this process. Today, you'll hear testimony from health professionals, survivors of conversion, quote, therapy, community leaders, the city attorney's office, the civil rights department, and those who led our community engagement and outreach. I also want to thank members of the Transgender Equity Council, an appointed board of community members, who heard a presentation on this ban and gave their feedback on continued engagement processes and have submitted a letter in support of the conversion therapy ban. I'd like to introduce Justin Lewandowski from Outfront Minnesota and Kat Solonic, did I pronounce your name right? Okay, no, um, from Outfront to start us off with the definition of conversion therapy. <laughs> Welcome Justin and Kat. Good afternoon. My name is Justin Lewandowski. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I am a policy and community organizer with Outfront Minnesota. I'm also the friend of three beautiful people who lost their lives to the damaging effects of conversion therapy. We are here today to define conversion therapy, why we need to ban this dangerous practice in the city of Minneapolis, and to present to you and the public a sound and strong ordinance and reporting structure. Conversion therapy, or reparative therapy, means any practice or treatment that seeks to change an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity, including efforts to change behaviors or gender expressions or to eliminate or reduce sexual or romantic attractions or feelings toward individuals of the same gender. Due to the serious and dangerous harms caused to minors subjected to conversion therapy or reparative therapy, today we will demonstrate the need for protecting the health and psychological well-being of our minors. Uh, to speak more directly to those damaging effects caused by this dangerous and discredited practice, I will introduce my uh, colleague, Kat, who is our Outfront uh, Policy Director, um, Director of Policy and Organizing. So, conversion therapy is not an accepted medical treatment. Over and over again, as we've done community engagements, both with medical doctors, mental health providers, uh, faith leaders, we see over and over again that conversion therapy, sometimes called reparative therapy or sexual orientation change efforts, um, is defended by proponents because of their belief that same-sex romantic orientation is a mental illness or developmental disability that could be cured. To put it simply, we know that's a bunch of hooey. Scientific evidence, on contrast, has found same-sex attraction and gender nonconformity are healthy, thriving aspects of human diversity. Sexual orientation effort practitioners base their treatments on unscientific and inaccurate understandings of sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. At best, people are trying to help kids. And at worst, these kids are ending up dead. I am grateful for all of the supporters who've come forward to speak out against this torture and for the city council considering its ban here in our city. And I will pass it on to Sarah Sheely, who's from the Minneapolis Department of Health. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thank you. My name is Sarah Sheely. I'm with the Minneapolis Health Department and I use she, her, her pronouns. So conversion therapy or efforts to change an individual's sexual orientation, gender or gender expression 
causes harm by perpetuating ideas of gender roles and identities and that being a sexual minority or identifying as LGBTQ is a mental illness. And more importantly, it may put young people at risk of serious harm. The American Psychological Association reported that the risks of conversion therapy include, and stick with me because the list is long, depression, guilt, hopelessness, shame, social withdrawal, suicidal ideation, substance abuse, stress, disappointment, self-blame, decreased self-esteem, increased self-hatred, hostility and blame towards parents, problems in sexual and emotional intimacy, sexual dysfunction, high-risk sexual behaviors, a feeling of being dehumanized and untrue to self, a loss of faith, and a sense of wasted time and resources. Everything in this list is contrary to healthy identity and youth development. And as Kat and Justin talked about, there's absolutely no credible evidence that supports the idea that mental or behavioral health interventions can change gender identity or sexual orientation and behavioral health experts and associations have long rejected this practice. Furthermore, the American Psychiatric Association recommends that legislation prohibit the practice of conversion therapy. The, conven the consensus among behavioral health professionals is that same gender sexual attraction and variations in gender identity and expression are normal are a normal part of the range of sexual orientation and human diversity interventions with the intended outcome of gender conformity or heterosexual orientation and those aimed at changing gender orientation are coercive, can be harmful, and should not be part of behavioral health treatment. According to the, UC, according to the UCLA Williams Institute, this year, alone an estimated 16,000 LGBTQ youth in states without bans will be exposed to conversion therapy from licensed professionals, including here in Minnesota. The Trevor Project released a 2019 report of the findings from the largest national survey on LGBTQ youth mental health that's ever been conducted. <laughs> Unfortunately, the data shows that we still have a lot of work to do to protect these youth. Two in three reported that someone had tried to convince them to change their sexual orientation or gender identity, and for youth who experience conversion therapy, 57% reported a suicide attempt in the past year, which is two times higher than those who hadn't received conversion therapy. In stark contrast to conversion therapy, improved so psychosocial outcomes are seen when social supports are put in place to recognize and affirm all gender and sexual identities in youth and when they are supported in their right to explore, define, and express their own identities. As we pursue being the first child-friendly city designation, um, it is critical that we ban the practice of conversion therapy in order to protect and promote the health and well-being of our Minneapolis youth. I would now like to introduce Jack Richter, who is a survivor of conversion therapy to share his story. Thank you. Welcome, Jack. Uh, 
Council Member Cunningham, all council members, I want to thank all of you for allowing me to speak here today. Um, I am a survivor of the XK movement. Uh, I am here on behalf of two wonderful individuals who suicided in the movement, both of whom were personal friends of mine. The, I would like to, if it's possible, enter in the record the obituary notice for Angela Marie Amick. Uh, it has a biography of her. Angela was in the XK movement, and both Angela and I both uh, spoke out against the XK movement at the University of Minnesota and told a group there of our experiences in it. Angela shot herself in the head at the age of 39. Angela, from all appearances, we were thinking that she was fine with herself from after experiencing the XK movement because she had come to a place of very much GLBT activism. The horrid thing about the XK movement is it leaves you with daily negative thoughts. And you still have to struggle with the years and years of indoctrination and propaganda that has been brought on you by non-licensed Suedo professionals. Uh, so I'd like to enter the record Angela's obituary and then also Jacob Grissom's obituary. I had a few different talks with Jacob and he totally struggled with himself being gay. And he passed away at the age of 26. These two young people had dreams and had goals for their lives, and that was completely snuffed out. I am wearing a sweatshirt today. Uh, I had gotten vocal scholarships to the prestigious Eastman School of Music, the Aspen Music Festival. Uh, I studied with teachers from Juilliard. I'm wearing the sweatshirt because when my half-sister took me into my dad's bedroom when she was visiting and opened her Bible after I had just come out to my mom who was sitting right there, she told me that I was a reprobate, that I was deviant, and she had highlighted Bible verses, which I'm sure many of us know, that I would not inherit the kingdom of God, taking it to mean that I would burn in hell. So she told me that I would burn in hell. My world at 22 years old came crashing down around me. I completely caved. And I never returned to Eastman School of Music to finish my degree. Because along with telling me that I was less, she handed me ex-gay propaganda of outpost ministries based right here in Minneapolis, and it is still functioning. And she handed me much material on how I could become straight through these ministries and that I needed to become straight if I was going to ever see my mother again in heaven. And at 22 years old, respectfully all, you have not had the benefit of, especially when you're raised very Catholic, you have not had the benefit of evolutionary biology being taught you. You have not had the benefit of human sexuality being taught to you. You have not been able to learn about, frankly, Charles Darwin. Evolutionary biology was what saved my life. I'm going to be very honest with you and say, atheism saved my life. I want to be very respectful of all those of faith in this room, and we have heard from some of them previously in the other room. Children have the right 
to believe in a loving God that loves them for who they are or the right to not believe. And they have the right to love themselves as a GLBT person without feeling the need to become someone they're not. And so I'd like to also enter into the record, if I may, um, an article that I wrote on my experiences in the ex-gay movement and how it is based on such incredibly faulty perceptions, if I may. Um, it was printed in the St. Cloud Times back in 2006. I was just fairly uh, fresh out of the Baptist church because in my process I became a Baptist fundamentalist and left the Catholic church. I started in outpost, uh, I would say roughly it was around, uh, I want to say 1991, and I was in it for 12 years. And during that time of 12 years of XK therapy, we in therapy sessions, we had to kneel in front of all of the counselors. This is one of the things we had to do. Kneel in front of the counselors and renounce and confess all of our sins, all of our parents' sins that we knew of, and all of our grandparents' and great-grandparents' sins, if we knew of any, and that was supposed to break the demonic curse of homosexuality because we were possessed by Satan. That is what they told us. And at 22 years old, when you have not had the benefit of science, you can't, when you were a person of faith, you can't jump across that divide. And they don't give you the compassion that you need. It's not there. Because at the same time as that happening, we had people break up with their gay partner that they had been with for years. I was in the movement for this long. They would break up with their gay partner who they had committed to and told the gay partner goodbye, causing the gay partner, you know, stress and, and depression. And then they would tell us all about how they met a woman. And they know that this woman was God's plan for them. And they know that that's their life partner, without a doubt. And then eventually, they'd have to confess because they cheated on that woman. Is that life-giving? Is that what we're supposed to have for a future? So um, this movement is something that should be banned worldwide. It's based on nothing but ideology that's based on books that were written thousands and thousands of years ago before science stepped in and human sexuality came in. Again, please, you can believe in a higher power, a God, whatever you call it, but it has to be a God of love or these kids will die. Um, and I'd just like to just mention uh, three books. Uh, Prayers for Bobby, which is the story of Bobby Griffith, and he actually uh, suicided and threw himself off of an overpass in front of a bus or truck, semi-truck. Uh, he actually uh, struggled for many years because his mom was relentless in her fundamentalist verses where he would be brushing his teeth and all of a sudden look up, there'd be a Bible verse saying that you need to become straight. You know, all those verses, the sick, the terrible six verses in the Bible. Um, so it was made into an amazing movie, this whole story. His mom, after he died, had to come to terms with that, and she actually became a huge gay activist after it. And she's, she's really done a beautiful job of making up for the loss of her son. Um, she, uh, this was made into a movie starring Sigourney Weaver. It is free on YouTube. Anybody can watch it for free. Prayers for Bobby. It's an amazing movie. Um, another book, Boy Erased, which you may know had come out as a movie as well with Russell Crowe and Nicole Kidman. Boy Erased is the true story of a man who was in ex therapy and it was incredibly similar to my experience. Um, and then the last book, if I may mention, is Anything But Straight. This is an expose on the ex-gay movement. It is written by Wayne Vicen. 
wonderful, wonderful man who um, exposed John Polk, who was a huge person, was on the cover of Time magazine, that he had become straight and married an ex-lesbian, and the Polks were on the front of Time magazine and everything, all this, that they had all this, and it caused so many people to go into the ex-gay movement. And then he was found in a Washington, D.C. gay bar, and they photographed him, and his photograph is on the front of the cover of the book with his back running away from the photographer. Uh, and that's the horrible thing. And now since then, he, he has actually accepted himself. He lives with a wonderful gay partner, and he now owns his own uh, catering business. I'm still working on my stuff, but what the XK movement ultimately does is it destroys your life in all ways, in all ways. And uh, this wonderful woman who had talked about um, the rights of all children, this is a moral and human right is to pass this ban. And I want to thank you all. Thank you so much, Jack, for sharing your story. If you want to submit things for the public record, if you'll go ahead and share it with the clerk. Thank you very yeah, much. Of course, thank you. All right, welcome, Christina Jr. Thank you, and thank you, Jack, really, for putting putting yourself out there and to talk about your experience and the importance of this movement um, with this uh, with moving the band forward. Um, I wanted to just talk about how the process went. Um, we had a, a work group um, that had city departments, community partners, community members all come together and uh, work and talk through um, how we were going to move forward um, and what that would look like for a conversion therapy ban, um, an ordinance to do that. And from that larger work group, we did a small subcommittee to really do some deep dive into community. Um, we worked very closely with uh, Outfront Minnesota, who's been a wonderful partner in conducting um, our community engagement. We did both um, in-person um, opportunities to connect as well as online opportunities. Um, just for to move through, because the data sets are actually kept separate, um, the methodology for the online um, is you had to answer questions that this subcommittee developed that um, that we focused on to ensure that we were addressing our needs at the city for ordinance development as well as um, an awareness education campaign and the process for reporting, et cetera, um, as well as for the efforts that Outfront has been doing and is going to continue to do. Um, our online responses were at 591. Um, and um, the in-person, in of course, you didn't have to answer all the questions, so there it lies why the data is separate. Uh, we do have a full report, though, that's comprehensive and talks about the two different data sets as well as uh, displays the, um, the data collected, the data information, which Junior will be uh, talking about very shortly. Um, that'll be housed on uh, Civil Rights website, um, as well as the copy of the ordinance, um, the process for reporting, and a few of other elements, um, such as resources that we had heard about and talked about. Um, and of course, later on in this presentation, we will uh, dive a little bit deeper into ordinance language, as well as the process. Um, and at that, I'm gonna turn it over to Junior. Hi, um, my name is Junior Avalos. I just want to thank everyone in the committee for letting me be here. Um, I use any pronouns, so I invite you to switch them up. Um, I do policy and organizing with Outfront, and I was one of the people doing a lot of the engagement work, and I just wanted to highlight a few of the things that we found while having these conversations. 61% um, of the respondents have been told that, the, that being LGBTQ plus can be changed. 24% um, of them experience, and these were over a thousand conversations that we were having with people here in the city of Minneapolis and all over the state. And so 24% of them uh, shared with us that they experienced some sort of practice so, uh, as conversion therapy themselves or knew someone uh, who had. So for example, in this room, one in four people uh, would have uh, gone through conversion therapy and I'm also a conversion therapy survivor. So I wanna thank Jack for sharing their story. Um, Everyone in this room now knows somebody that's right next to them. 47% um, of respondents didn't know who they could tell or ask uh, for support either for themselves or, or for others. And 98% of the respondents uh, feel there is a need for this ordinance. And so uh, it's important that we know that, you know, while having these conversations, a lot of people were very open and vulnerable, and I really appreciate that. Um, many people shared their experiences of 
not a feeling welcomed, of being abandoned by their family members. And many of them also shared the, the importance of why they moved here to Minnesota and to Minneapolis um, because of the history that we have for being champions for LGBTQ people. And so I think that's really important to note, um, especially. Um, there's stories of how, you know, as young as 11th graders, uh, we've had conversations with middle schoolers also sharing their stories about like not feeling welcome, feeling pressure to change who they are. Um, so those are just some of the findings that we had um, and they're also accessible to you. Um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the important um, work that we did in order to find these findings. Um, and then I want to actually pass it on now to Andy Johnson, who's the Associate Professor of Psychology for Bethel University. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Professor. Council members, my name is Dr. Andy Johnson. I'm Associate Professor of Psychology at Bethel University. Uh, I don't speak on behalf of Bethel University. It's merely to point out that I'm a professor at an evangelical and pietistic university. I've been teaching psychology of religion for longer than most of my students have been alive. Uh, my bachelor's degree is in psychology from Drury College in Springfield, Missouri, which is associated with the Disciples of Christ and United Church of Christ. My master's in psychology and PhD in counseling psychology is from University of Notre Dame, which is recognized as a, a Roman Catholic university. My APA approved internship is from Pine Rest Christian Hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is affiliated with the uh, Christian Reformed Church. Uh, in short, well, I mean, I could go on and on. I'm past member at large for the Society for the Psychology of Religion and Spirituality, which is Division 36 of the American Psychological Association. I'm currently co-chair of the APA Division 36 Presidential Task Force on Religion and Poverty. I'm a board member of the National Partnership to End Interpersonal Violence, and am co-chair of the ta action team on uh, mentoring and training uh, because of my expertise in religion and gender-based violence. In short, I'm familiar with the interface uh, between religion and psychology. A ban is sorely needed uh, uh, with regards to practicing conversion therapy. This is not a matter of religion, however. This is a matter of putting an end to mental health malpractice. Uh, I strongly support the ordinance before you to ban conversion therapy. Conversion therapy, also referred to as reparative therapy or sexual orientation change efforts, refers to the efforts of mental health uh, professionals to try to change the sexual orientation or gender identity of an LGBT person. Uh, the ordinance before you protects the mental health of LGBT adolescents and adults from conversion therapy, which research has demonstrated to be harmful and ineffective. First of all, there is no scientifically rigorous evidence demonstrating the effectiveness of conversion therapy. This evidence does not exist. Two, scientific studies have found negative effects associated with conversion therapy, however, numerous studies, including but not limited to increased levels of depression, increased suicidal ideation, increased suicide attempts, and increased substance abuse in adults. Recent research has found adolescents surviving conversion therapy to have less educational attainment in addition to the increased levels of depression and suicide risk adult survivors of conversion therapy experience. Conversion therapy is considered unethical and harmful mental health practice. Major mental health organizations with policy statements against the use of conversion therapy include, but are not limited to, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American uh, Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Psychoanalytic Association, the American Counseling Association, and the National Association of Social Workers. Conversion therapy among, use among minors has also been condemned by a report submitted to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration known as SAMHSA. In conclusion, my position is undergirded by scientific evidence and the medical principle of above all or first do no harm. Responsible, culturally competent practitioners should not engage in conversion therapy. I strongly encourage you to vote in favor of the uh, conversion therapy ban. Approving this ordinance allows Minneapolis to protect vulnerable populations from mental health malpractice. Thank you, Councilman.
Thank you, Professor Johnson. Council members, so I will be inviting uh, Eric Nilsson um, up to talk about the actual, um, some just of components of the uh, ordinance. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome, Mr. Nielsen. Thank you. <clears throat> Eric Nilsson, he, him, his, I'm with the city attorney's office, Chair Cunningham, members of the committee. The proposed ordinance before you it really goes to the heart of governance, which is to protect uh, the health and well-being of its most vulnerable citizens, in this case, minors. Um, where other levels of government have not seen fit to act, the city can and will. <clears throat> it's a relatively simple ordinance, as you see and uh, see it before you. Uh, it's just a little over a page. It largely hinges on definitions, uh, because ultimately it is a prohibition. And in our extensive work uh, that we did through the, the city staff work group, um, we evaluated many alternative uh, approaches to this. And Every single one of them is lacking. There is nothing short of a prohibition on this completely discredited practice that will work. <clears throat> so the ordinance itself is a prohibition on the practice of conversion therapy. So it largely hinges on the definition of provider, which is before you on the screen. <clears throat> uh, health professionals in Minnesota um, uh, uh, largely are able to, to practice through at least three different means, including licensure, certification, or registration. And so the definition of provider recognizes those three means. Uh, it also references the specific definitions, which are extensive definitions in state law, of mental health practitioners and mental health professionals. And then it provides a representative list of, that is not an exclusive list by any means, of those practitioners. <clears throat> Let's see. Here. I've become a Luddite already, I, technology, but spacebar worked. Um, so uh, it, it, it prohibits the practice of conversion therapy by providers as defined. It is not a prohibition on communication. That obviously impl implicates free speech, but it is a ban on the practice. <clears throat> we've also proposed as a staff group companion amendments to chapter two, so we've, um, Propose that the ordinance would be enforced through our civil administrative um, citation and fine process. It's a well um, established process in Chapter 2 of the code. There are lots of city departments that use that process currently, and the amendment to Chapter 2 simply adds the Civil Rights Department as an authorized body to be able to uh, issue citations pursuant to that uh, chapter. Um, and then we also updated the definitions, our existing definitions in our civil rights title of the code for gender identity and sexual orientation, and we've updated those definitions in conjunction with the same definitions which are in uh, our proposed chapter 402. So those will now read the same. As of today, uh, there are approximately 53 municipal and county bans in states with no statewide ban and 18 statewide bans. Uh, Statewide, ban, uh, statewide prohibitions in, uh, have been upheld in both the Ninth and, th and Third Circuits um, of the courts. And in terms of peer cities, uh, cities such as Denver, Seattle, several cities in Ohio, Cincinnati and Columbus, several cities in Wisconsin, including Milwaukee and Madison, uh, have all adopted city uh, prohibitions. The, um, the, the peer city ordinances vary slightly um, a, a large, all geared towards the same goal, obviously, but very slightly. They often vest enforcement authority in different departments of the city. Um, what we saw was that they were primarily vested in either the Civil Rights or Human Rights Department, the equivalent of a Community Relations Department, or a Health Department. Our proposed ordinance had, uh, positions the Civil Rights Department um, as, as the enforcing agency. And then also just to note, in terms of current events, uh, the Utah governor's, governor is in the process of signing their bans, so there will be 19 bans by the end of this week. And uh, there are also many pending uh, ordinances at both the, the city and county levels across the country. So I think the next step, if I'm, yes, uh, we'll turn it over to my friend and colleague in the Civil Rights Department, Frank Reed, to talk about the administrative citation enforcement process. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Welcome, Mr. Frank. Good afternoon. My name is Frank Reed from the Civil Rights Department. He, him, his pronouns, please. Um, 
I wore a red shirt to mark this moment, but I've been outdone. I admit it. <laughs> I will be presenting on the enforcement mechanism for the proposed ordinance. But there's something I have to note for the, for the moment and for the record. Um, this is a civil rights matter, as is anything involving an individual's right to be who they were meant to be. Uh, with that value in mind and the beauty of it, it is also an idea that's codified over and over again within the Minneapolis Code. I would offer to you then that the Civil Rights Department is well suited to enforce this ordinance to its utmost in the matter defined in the language. I would direct you now to the Chapter 402 process. That's an error. It should be 402. Um, the flow of work is as follows. Um, we made this as simple as we could because we thought it was the best way to support the language of the ordinance and to be effective for people uh, as they try to apply to it. Um, it starts with the receipt of a complaint, which might be in person, through the website, or by phone. From then, a preliminary investigation would take place to determine whether there is proper jurisdiction, whether the basic facts are in fact true, and what the merit of the case are. From there, we would pursue a warning letter that would be issued to the wrongdoer uh, with a compliance date. The thought here would be it would be quick, within 24 to 48 hours. And from there, a follow-up investigation would occur to determine whether or not there was a compliance. Um, where there was non-compliance, the fine would result. And as uh, Eric noted earlier, um, an appeal could be made through our Chapter 2 appeal process within the city. Uh, as I noted, and you can see there uh, on the flow chart, um, one place that a case might end up being closed is after the preliminary or, um, investigation where an invalid complaint might be found out to be in existence for lack of jurisdiction, lack of facts. Uh, but also later on after the follow-up investigation, we're able to find that there's compliance. That is all I have today. Thank you, I appreciate that um, explanation of how it will actually be implemented. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Cunningham, Council Vice, uh, Council Vice President Jenkins. Um, Princess our works Council too. Pardon? Princess works too. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yes. might have been the, that might have been the slip, possibly. Um, the, we actually, this was the end of our presentation, but I felt it was important that I come up um, because we've just um, been informed that um, there are a lot of people viewing um, our live stream as we have through our government TV, and a lot of people are contacting Outfront Minnesota, and so we just wanted to remind folks that uh, Outfront does have a crisis line, and the number is... Uh, 800-800-0350. We know that a lot of this content has been really triggering, and we just want to make sure that anyone watching knows that there are resources available. Can you say that one more time a little slower? Yes. 800-800-0350. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that thorough presentation. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? No. Oh, okay, there we go. Council Vice President Jenkins. Yeah, you know, I, I absolutely am just um, so, so proud and so thrilled to be able to, to work on this ordinance with, um, with you and your leadership in this committee and, and on this effort. Um, it really is one of the, the issues of our times and um, the violence that we see against um, LGBTQ people and particularly um, trans women of color is um, continuously per perpetuated by these types of policies, these types of, this type of thinking that permeates our, our culture and society. And while we can make ordinances to um, to sort of dictate people's behavior, it's really important that we work on trying to change people's hearts and minds as well. Um, and so, with with that in mind, um, you know, I'm I'm 
I'm thrilled to to vote for this today and and hope that my colleagues will will join me but I will be um, committed to continuing to work on the process of of trying to to change people's hearts and minds as we we move through this work thank you great thank you um, I will go ahead now and move to oh, I will open the public hearing uh, if you are interested in speaking at, as a part of the public hearing please sign in over at the city clerk will you please wave your hand so folks know um, so please sign in over there if you're interested in speaking today all right so what I'll do is I'll read off three names at a time uh, if folks could go ahead and come, oops, excuse me come up so that we can move through uh, the list that'd be great so first up on number one, we have Michael Newland, followed by Troy Stevenson, and number three, Dr. Paul, so I apologize if I say people's names, Dr. Paul, come on up, all right. Uh, thank you, Chair Cunningham, Vice President Jenkins, and respected committee members. Uh, my name is Michael Newland, and I am a Minneapolis resident, and have lived in Minneapolis for over 10 of the past 15 years, and I absolutely love this city. Over 20 years ago, at the age of 11 or 12, I realized I was attracted exclusively to the same sex. This was problematic for me because it was in stark conflict with my faith, and my faith was and is the most important thing to me. The internal conflict became all-consuming. I believed my sexual orientation could change, but I needed guidance on how to pursue that effectively and how to reconcile my faith and my sexuality. And so at the age of 17, as a minor and of my own accord, I sought out help. I received help from several faith-based organizations that provided a safe and supportive environment where I could be open and honest about my struggles with my faith and sexuality. I didn't feel judged or condemned. I was not promised a quick solution, but was encouraged to examine the issues in my life that may have contributed to the development of same-sex attractions. And as I worked through a myriad of issues, indeed my sexual attractions toward men gradually diminished and heterosexual attractions eventually emerged. Today I can say that I am living at peace and I'm very satisfied with my life. In fact, I'm now happily married to a woman. Our relationship along with the accompanying attractions developed, developed very naturally prior to our marriage. The help I received made all of this possible. It was not coercive, but was rather compassionate care involving talk therapy and spiritual guidance. How could I not want others to have access to the same or similar care to which I had access, care which was life-changing? I personally know dozens of people around the country, some who are mental health professionals and some who are faith leaders, who provide compassionate care for those wanting to explore options regarding sexual orientation or gender identity that are consistent with their faith. Is that a timer? Yes. Okay, can I do one more sentence? Just, just to close. Okay. Uh, my hope is that those who desire to pursue counseling and, su and uh, support to achieve goals and outcomes in adherence with their faith may continue to do so because only in this way will Minneapolis be a truly welcoming and fair and equitable city for every resident. Thank you. Thank you. I did forget that piece of the uh, logistics. We do have a two minute timer. If folks can please respect that time so we can ha make sure everybody's voice is in space, that would be appreciated. Welcome. I, well, thank you. Um, thank you for Chair, or Chairperson Cunningham and to members of the committee. Uh, my name is Troy Stevenson. I'm with the Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is the world's largest suicide prevention organization dedicated to the protection of LGBTQ youth. Um, and we thank you for the opportunity to be here in support of this ordinance, which will protect youth here in Minneapolis from um, the practice of conversion therapy by licensed practitioners. We just completed this year our, our national survey, which had uh, 34,000 respondents, making it the largest survey of its kind conducted. We found that 5% of LGBT youth had reported being subjected to actual conversion therapy in a formal setting with as many as two-thirds going through this in some form, be it from personal or religious or, or some other, other aspect. From that, we found that 42% of uh, those youth that had been through this had reported suicide attempts in the last year, in the last 12 months. And 
That's more than twice the rate of those not experiencing conversion therapy. When you look at transgender non-binary survivors of conversion therapy, that attempt rate goes up to 57%. In the last year alone, the Trevor Project has been con contacted by over 16,000 young Minnesotans who have, have been through some sort of crisis and called our, our crisis line. We have a 24-hour crisis line uh, through phone, text, and chat, which young people from across the country reach out to us when um, they're in danger of self-harm. In conclusion, this ordinance would prevent licensed professionals and mental health professionals from using this discredited practice on patients under the age of 18. And we thank you for taking it up. We've got copies of that survey available, which we'll put in the record and, and are available to any of you. Thank you at the time. Right on the dot. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So um, after Dr. Paul, we have Freeman Wicklin, uh, Jace Coaster, and Roger Sanchez. Chair Cunningham, council members. My name is Paul Goering. I'm a psychiatrist and the vice president of mental health and addiction at Alina Health. I'm also a practicing psychiatrist for the last three decades. I'm here testifying on behalf of Alina Health in support of banning conversion therapy in Minneapolis, not only because it's good health policy, but because it's the right thing to do for the city. At Alina Health, we're proud to support our commitment to whole person care, knowing that that includes advocating for all the patients we serve in Minneapolis. We also know that conversion therapy is a practice that causes real and lasting harm. It also lacks credible support to back the claims it makes. Let me be clear, gender and sexual identity are not mental illnesses, neither do they require therapy or treatment. Thank you for creating the space to have this important conversation, and we fully share the goal of creating a Minneapolis where all people are welcomed and embraced for who they are. Alina Health is pleased to lend its support to the measure to ban conversion therapy in Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to Alina Health for that. All right, next up we have Freeman Wicklin, Jace uh, Coaster, and Roger Sanchez. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Freeman, uh, and I'm cisgender, but I'm happy to use they, she, or he pronouns. And uh, I came out to myself, I'm just a community member, and that's why I'm speaking. Uh, I came out to myself when I was 15 years old and continued to stay in the closet for many years after just because of the hostility in the general society. At 26 is when I finally came out to my parents and all my friends. And my parents had just read an article in the Star Tribune about a conversion therapy program. And they are well-meaning, very loving people. I have nothing bad to say about my parents, but they wanted to they wanted for us as a family to go and attend this. Thankfully, I was already out of the house. I could support myself. I didn't have to feel coerced to do this. Um, but I uh, told them, I said, I'll only go if it's free and if you guys go to a PFLAG meeting as well, you know? Because um, I thought, well, I'm an, I'm an activist. I'll do a little undercover investigation, see what's going on. and. Uh, you know, get my parents to a PFLAG meeting. But I really want to point out that this doesn't just harm LGBTQ people, it also harms our entire families. In the newspaper article about this group, they were saying that because my parents were not conforming to societal gender norms, that is why I am gay, basically. They blame the parents for us as if we're so um, outrageous. That, that somebody needs to be blamed. I mean, they should be praised for us as LGBTQ people. And as many have shown, uh, suicide rates are, are bad. Um, the destruction of the family is bad. This isn't just conversion therapy. I agree with Andrea Jenkins. This is conversion abuse. And when people are looking for options for health, abuse should not be an option. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, we're going to move to um, Javin Swanson, Stephen Patter, followed by Diane Brady Leeton. And I apologize if I say your names incorrectly. Is 
Javin, Javin, followed by Stephen, and then Diane. Thank you, Chair Cunningham, Vice President Jenkins, and members of the committee. My name is Javen Swanson. I'm one of the pastors at Gloria Day Lutheran Church, and I use he, him, his pronouns. I think it's important for Christian clergy to speak about this issue because, as we've heard, it's uh, the leading proponents of this practice are people who claim to speak from a Christian perspective. As a Christian, I do believe that God seeks to breathe new life into that which is dead and repair that which is broken. The problem with conversion therapy is that it presumes LGBTQ people are broken on account of their sexual orientation or gender identity. But I believe that God creates people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities, people who manifest divine creative goodness, not people who are broken and in need of repair. And besides that, there's little evidence that conversion therapy even works. As you've heard, all the major medical and mental health organizations condemn the practice, not only as ineffectual, but extremely harmful. For years, Exodus International was one of the most well-known well organizations providing conversion therapy, but it disbanded in 2012 after that organization's president stepped down and disavowed the practice. Just after that, a longtime chair of that organization's board of directors came out of the closet himself and acknowledged that conversion therapy doesn't work. Conversion therapy only succeeds in producing increased incidents of depression and suicide in people who are made to believe they are irredeemably flawed and abhorrent to God. Now, I would like to see the state legislature ban conversion therapy, but if the legislature refuses to get this done, then we need our cities to do what's right, as Minneapolis did previously in establishing domestic partner registries when the state legis uh, when uh, uh, before same-sex couples had the freedom to marry, and as the city did in establishing earned sick and safe time and living wage ordinances when the state legislature failed to get it done. In the absence of leadership in our state legislature, we need our cities to act, and so I support. I thank you for supporting this ordinance. Thanks to you. Thank you, Javen. Next up, we have Stephen, followed by Diane, and then Mara on deck. Hi, my name is Stephen Patton. I use they, them pronouns. Um, when I was 12 years old, I first realized that other people were straight. Um, I didn't realize that it wasn't common to be gay. Um, that is about the time that I entered into uh, reparative therapy. Um, I first tried to kill myself when I was 14. Um, when I was 15, I met a friend at church camp who struggled with the same thing. Um, she did kill herself. When I was 16, I tried again. I still have the scars on my wrists. When I was 17, I tried to run away from home. When I was 18, I was told that I could go to this boarding school that would fix me. Um, but uh, instead, I chose to be homeless. I would have rather faced the streets and been hungry than ever have to go through that again. Um, the next several years, it took a long time for me to become a stable, productive, uh, secure member of the community. Um, I faced a lot of physical violence and struggled a lot. Um, I'm currently in therapy for depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress from all of this. Um, yeah, that's, that's my story. And um, a 12-year-old kid should never have to go through that. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. All right. Diane followed by Mara with Lee, number 11 on deck. Thank you. My name is Diane brady Layton. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Minneapolis. I'm a parent of a member of the LGBTQ community, and I'm a psychotherapist in private practice. Before private practice, I spent 20 years of my career as a psychotherapist at the University of Minnesota Student Mental Health Clinic. Early in my career, I would often be the first person that someone would come out to. These students were often scared of family and religious judgment and rejection. Many were considering suicide in large part due to the belief that who they were was not okay and that there was not a place for them in this world. 
As the years went on, I started noticing a change, and this change is supported by research. As society became more affirming and equitable, and laws back this affirmation and equity with protections, students were more often coming in confident in their identity and with the full affirmation and support of their families. So who they were and who they loved was not an issue, but rather an asset in their healing. But those who faced rejection from families continued to present with this rejection negatively impacting their mental health and well-being. I urge you to vote to ban harmful conversion therapy, or if others have said abuse, in the city of Minneapolis. I stand here not only representing myself, but also thousands of other parents, my professional organization, and my religious community. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know a lot of folks can use some mom hugs, so thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, we, next up we have Mara, followed by Lee, followed by Reverend Dan. Next up. Hi, my name is Mara Glupka. I'm a transgender woman who transitioned at the age of 58, eight years ago. I'm currently residing in Richfield, and I'm here to speak in favor of this conversion therapy ban. Uh, and more than that, for an expanded interpretation of it, if possible, because of an experience that I had when I was 15 years old with Catholic Charities. <laughs> now, I wasn't beaten with Bibles or publicly shamed, but that carried with it the same stigma that brought suicidality and a uh, feeling of rejection from my parents that conversion therapy does. So, uh, And I'd also uh, like to take this opportunity to call attention to a a man named Dr. Robert Spitzer, who was the consensus, I believe, uh, founder, inventor of conversion therapy. In 2012, he apologized to the world for all the damage that he had done. And in my view, that should have been the end of it right then and there. And uh, I'll close by congratulating the city of Minneapolis for being the first city to ever pass uh, protections for transgender people back in 1975. And then also remind people that the state of Minnesota was the first state to pass protections for transgender people in 1993. Now here we sit, what, 18th in line for conversion therapy as a state? Well, yeah, we can at least do this as a city, right? Um, so that's all I have, thank you very much. Thank you, Mara. Not only have we not passed it yet, but Utah has passed it before us, so we've got some catch up to do. Only a little bit of shade to Utah. All right, next up we have Lee, followed by Reverend Adolfson, and then Jerome Evans. Chair Cunningham, members of the committee, I have uh, filled out the survey via out front and have uh, looked through the ordinance findings that I have printed out and I see it as an insulting double standard for someone who is not old enough to legally consent to be subjected to conversion abuse. And uh, while I had not been through conversion therapy per se, I have undergone a few things that were similar, being exposed to some of the insidious messaging and uh, I am still working to get through some elements of shame and self-doubt to this day. Uh, it, it pains me to think that there are state senators to which the ability to torture gay teenagers is somehow a political priority, and I thank you for this mutual effort to change that. And uh, most of you know me as a voice on uh, climate emergency, and I have to say there are profound interconnections where multiple liberations are mutually tied together when it comes to scientific integrity. There is a great irony where everything that the climate science dismissives say about global warming is actually what is true about conversion abuse. It is a dangerous pseudoscience used to advance an inhumane social agenda, and we can't let those who dismiss real science, exalt pseudoscience in that irony. 
and uh, thank you for the great work and was glad to know about the the process which went into the ordinance thank you lee mm -hmm. welcome up next we have reverend Anderson, followed by jerome evans then with kamara on deck good afternoon chair cunningham vice chair jenkins and members of the committee I am Reverend Dan Adolfson, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I am associate pastor at First Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the Whittier neighborhood of Minneapolis and past moderator of Disciples LGBTQ Plus Alliance, a denomination-wide advocacy organization that works for welcome and inclusion for people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. I am also proud to stand before you this afternoon as a proud out gay man called by God to serve God's people. At First Christian Church, we are deeply involved in supporting LGBTQ youth in the Twin Cities, whether it be through community partnerships with a variety of organizations or through having a public presence at the Twin Cities Pride Festival every year. For many, many years in all those partnerships and even at Pride, we were looked at with a lot of suspicion. A church that supports queer youth and their families? What is this? After hearing that statement one time too many, I started asking questions and the stories that I heard were heartbreaking. I heard over and over again from queer youth and their families about interaction with faith communities that told them they were broken. They were damaged goods that needed to be fixed. And oh, by the way, we've got just the repair ticket for you. Many parents are fearful when a child comes out either because they don't personally know someone in the LGBTQ community or because they fear their child's lives will be all the more difficult. The repair promise of conversion therapy endangers those families, sometimes irreparably. It also harms and defrauds young adults who've paid thousands of dollars for treatments with no scientific credibility. The statistics are damning. LGBTQ youth who experience conversion therapy are 8.4 times more likely to attempt suicide, experience depression, isolation, or substance abuse. As faith leaders, we are called to minister to people in ways that protect them from harm. Chair Cunningham and the rest of the committee, I ask you to support this bill as it protects our LGBTQ citizens and their families from a practice that cannot deliver the promise that it makes. Thank you. Shout out to Award 4 residents. Next up, we have Jerome, followed by Kamara, then number 15, Matthew Shirka. Welcome. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jerome, and I am here to express gratitude. Um, thank you for bringing this bill banning conversion abuse. I am a member of the LGBTQ plus community, and we are often called a marginalized community. And among so-called marginalized communities, it is easy to point to examples of the government not working. In fact, when the federal government seems generally dysfunctional, when the state government chooses not to enact protections for its most vulnerable residents, it becomes very tempting to say that government in general does not work. And when people in marginalized communities believe that government does not work, they do not participate. And that creates an unfortunate cycle. So I want to thank you for breaking that cycle here today. Thank you for articulating loudly and proudly that here in Minneapolis, we protect the most vulnerable. We protect our LGBTQ community and we protect our children. You're doing excellent work and I'm very appreciative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. We have next up Kamara, followed by Matthew Shirka, and then um, that's the end of the list. I think we have one more um, person who would like to speak, but if anybody else is interested in speaking, please come and sign up over at the with the clerk. Welcome. Chair Cunningham, Carl's Poppin, committee members. My name is Kamara Julia Bashar, and I use they, them pronouns. I'm a local actor with Breaking Ice at a Minneapolis theater institution, Pillsbury House Theater, and most recently I wrapped uh, filming the season five pilot of a Minnesota made web series called Theater People. Uh, both places they respect my pronouns. Uh, I'm an out and proud black, pansexual, non-binary Muslim. 
And I wasn't going to say anything today, but I was disappointed and not surprised to see that there wasn't an imam present today on behalf of queer Muslim youth. And that enraged me. Y'all are slacking, period. I am here for Muslim youth. I am here to say that this practice is torture and unquestionably haram. That any Muslim adult engaging in it, encouraging it, and witnessing it without intervention should consider their actions a hell-level offense against Allah and all of creation. And to remind any queer Muslim child that has been told in what should be a holy and safe space that they are lacking and need to change, any queer Muslim youth that is experiencing this abuse and feels alone, that when the Prophet وسلم, ascended the heavens and saw all the Muslims that ever were and will ever be he saw you, not just the straight ones, not just the cis ones, but you. In that moment, which stands out beyond the confines of our current time of ignorance, you as a whole were and are accepted. You are beautiful and as Allah intended, and you are not alone and never have been. Salaamu Alaikum. Thank you. All right, next up we have Matthew Shirka. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Matthew Shirka, he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm a survivor of conversion therapy. Um, at the age of 16, after coming out to my father, uh, I was placed in a treatment by licensed professionals. And for five years, uh, they explained that being LGBTQ is a psychological condition that is caused by childhood traumas. Uh, and there's many names that go with that, like you heard earlier, whether it's called reparative therapy, reintegrative therapy, um, it's not a therapy at all. Um, and these therapists have used a theory where um, they try to make heteronormative roles and gender roles. And so for three years, I wasn't allowed to speak to my mom and two sisters, so I would defeminize, not learning any effeminate behaviors, or understand that I was female, um, and that females were the opposite sex I was supposed to be attracted to, um, meanwhile identifying with males. Um, my treatment had moved around many states. I started in New York, I was in New Jersey, California, and I attended a camp in Virginia. Um, a lot of these therapists work nationally. Um, they convene at conferences, and then they go back to their home states like Minnesota, where they um, have whether ministers or other therapists who are licensed to do conversion therapy. Um, in 2012, when we created the model legislation in California uh, with the National Center for Lesbian Rights, we created the Born Perfect campaign, and California was the first state to do that. Six, seven years later, um, it's really an honor to be working with everyone at Outfront Minnesota. Um, there's now 18 states that have passed laws protecting minors from conversion therapy and 60 municipalities across the country. Um, and there's the really important thing I want to add is that there's a lot of bipartisan support. There's support from religious leaders and conservatives. If you look at the 18 states, seven of the governors who have signed those laws are Republican. And we received bipartisan support in every single step of this way, um, letting LGBT people know that it is a part of the human condition and that they are born perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Last up, we have Jesus. Welcome. Thank you so much, Council. Um, I just wanted to read one last statement uh, from an anonymous person uh, of the Jewish background and faith. As a queer and trans Jew in a powerful community of queer, trans, and allied Jews, I know that our spirituality stands with our people. I know that we are the future of our faith, that I follow so many powerful Jewish, Jewish leaders in saying this, and that our community stands against this practice. To every queer and trans Jew who didn't know you were possible, you are possible. You are perfect, and we all exist. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Is anybody else interested in speaking? Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Anyone? Anyone. All right. Seeing no other folks, I will go ahead and close the public hearing, and I will call upon Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much. I just want to extend my gratitude to everybody who came and spoke today and shared their story, and also to the staff who worked forward, um, worked to bring this forward, and my colleagues here for all your work on this. Um, this is amazing. It's too bad uh, that we couldn't get this done at the state level. Um, but I think that we're smart to use this as an opportunity to educate ourselves and educate our community about it. I think we should warn folks that um, 
right outside the city border. In fact, chances are people will be moving outside the city border to relocate if they're, and I'm not sure, and hopefully we'll find out for sure if there's more than one or two that are practicing this in the city right now and put an end to that immediately. But this is something we need to be on the lookout for and to advise um, our friends and family members about and also look to the other um, cities near us to take action on this as well. Hopefully we can build this momentum and we can move forward with it and have a statewide ban and a national ban as soon as possible. So really appreciate all the work and effort that's gonna do this and proud to support it and grateful. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. I wanna thank everyone for sharing your deeply personal and moving stories today. It takes a lot of bravery uh, to be vulnerable like that and to share these often traumatic experiences. Uh, it's really powerful. I wanna thank my uh, colleagues who are authoring this. I wanna thank the organizations that are supporting this. I wanna thank our staff as well for all of their work on this. I can't think of something as fundamental to a person as who they are attracted to. And this idea that it would be a quote unquote therapy to have somebody try to reject who they are at such a fundamental level, it's destructive, it's traumatic, it's abusive, I'd call it psychological torture. It can cause reparable harm and as we think about our role as a committee, especially around public health, and something we often talk about are these adverse childhood experiences. This seems like it fits just in line with that, that this is anyone exposed to this quote unquote conversion therapy is in a traumatic experience, especially as a child. And as a result, it puts them at reduced health outcomes, at reduced opportunities, and even uh, as we've tragically heard, uh, reduced life, reduced lifespan. And so I think it is our obligation to pass this and to stand up for our residents in the city, to stand up for public health as well. Um, Lee, who is testifying today, spoke about um, the idea that conversion therapy is trying to advance a social agenda. And I couldn't agree more with that idea because to me the only room for therapy here is for homophobes, for transphobes, for racists, for Islamophobics, for people who hold hate in their heart because that is a learned bigotry and ignorance that can be overcome. So I'm proud to stand today uh, with my colleagues in supporting this. I really hope we get a state law passed on this and that this moves the ball forward on that and helps build momentum and that ultimately we see a national and an international worldwide ban on these destructive practices. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councilmember Schrader. I'll, I'll be really brief, just wanna echo um, and also thank uh, my colleagues for working on this. Um, I wanna thank you all for coming out, uh, just kinda to echo the Thanks on that part, but I also wanted to thank uh, the people of faith that came out and spoke for this. Like this is something that is, <sighs> my faith doesn't stand for this. And it, it was very powerful to have those voices too. And it's, it's very hard to see uh, what other people, um, reasons for using conversion, like the, the way they justify it. And so it is very, it's very um, heartening to see uh, people stand up and say not in our name. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and, and jump in queue here. So first I just want to say thank you to the city staff and folks um, who joined the presentation for such a robust presentation. It's very informative. Um, a part of the work that we do is also informing the public because as was stated, this is live streamed, this is saved. So folks are able to be able to refer back to it. So now we have a public record about this abusive practice with science and information on the public record. Records. So thank you so much for taking taking that responsibility so seriously. Thank you to everyone who testified today. Um, it is incredibly um, moving that folks are willing to stand up in front of the city council 
which I was once on that side of the the podium. So I stood there with my hands shaken before. So I know how intimidating that could be to be able to expose some of the most traumatic experiences that you have gone through. So I just want to name that I'm grateful that you all did so because it will help save lives um, and it will help change lives. Um, Thank you to the work group for all of the work that you all did. Um, as you saw, the first slide that we had had a whole list of people um, from different departments, uh, ranging from the health department to IT to MPD. We had quite a robust group. We had clergy. We had out front youth serving organizations. This work was taken very seriously uh, because we are talking about extremely vulnerable young people. And so we wanted to make sure that we were as thorough as possible as a coalition to be able to do this. I want to make sure I give a shout out though to State Representative Hunter Cantrell and uh, State Senator Scott Dibble because they really helped us build on the momentum that was already there. There was already a foundation there. We were able to build on that on the local level. There was a lot of interest and excitement already there. I am myself, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure everybody's probably heard it this, at this point, but I'm black, queer, and trans. And I, in my own experience, have experienced conversion therapy. I was exposed to it um, as an early teen in, through my evangel evangelical church that I was raised in. Um, so when I became a policymaker as somebody who is an intersectionally marginalized person, I take this responsibility very seriously to ensure of disrupting the cycle of childhood trauma. Childhood trauma is a public health crisis, not only in the city, not in this, uh, only in the state, but across this country. Adverse childhood experiences, as my colleague spoke to, has lifelong repercussions. And so us as policymakers working in collaboration with community, anything that we can do to disrupt that cycle and instead create pathways towards healing, that is our moral obligation to do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am competitive, so I'm very excited that we are the first city in Minneapolis or in Minnesota to pass this ban, <laughs> but really hoping we are not the last. Today is about setting a standard, an expectation. We look to other municipalities, cities, townships across the state and say, you too must step up. We need to get the momentum moving so that it is inevitable that it will pass at the state. That way we have really deep, um, deep or uh, excuse me, jurisdictional oversight that can enforce these protections on a statewide. So people aren't leaving the city of Minneapolis to go to the suburbs to be able to access it. But instead, they can't go anywhere because it's not a welcomed practice here. This is abuse. And I really appreciate the language of talking about it as conversion abuse and abuse rather than conversion therapy. Because what we do when we call it therapy is we perpetuate the delusion that it is therapy. So I really am grateful for that language being introduced in this work. So thank you. All right. Seeing no further comments or questions from my colleagues, I would like to, um, I also just want to speak briefly to the definition change. Um, so what was considered radical in 1975 um, is no longer applicable in 2019, to say the least. So as we were going through this work, um, we stumbled across the definitions of sexual orientation and gender identity. It was like, Ugh. Let's go ahead and clean that up while we're at it. So that is just so folks understand that that's actually a pretty big deal, but I also want to give a shout out to our ancestors and elders in 1975 who were the first to do that. So, uh, so we're just building upon the legacy that was brought already before us. So with that, colleagues, I would like to move approval of the passage of an ordinance amending Title 15 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances related to offenses, adding thereto a new chapter 402 entitled Prohibition of Conversion Therapy to Prohibit Conversion Therapy or Reparative Therapy. 
Also, the passage of ordinance amending Title I, Chapter 2 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances related to general provisions, administrative hear enforcement and hearing process, amending provisions related to personnel authorized to issue citations, and the passage of an ordinance amending Title VII, Chapter 139 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances related to civil rights, in general, amending definitions related to gender identity and sexual orientation to coincide with Chapter 402 prohibiting conversion therapy. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Thank you everyone so much for this. It's good. I heard it. <laughs> Yay. So just so folks know for the next steps, this will be going before the full city council for approval on November 22nd. So that, so it, this is the first step and then it will pass uh, on the 22nd as well. So thank you everybody for coming today, for being a part of this, for, for putting your voice out there and supporting. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next item. Um, if folks are transitioning out into the hallway, I ask for conversations to please happen out there so we can finish up our other two public hearings. So I'll just give one second here, uh, maybe a couple for folks to be able to transition out. And as we do so, um, I will invite up the next uh, ordinance, the green to go, passage of an ordinance amending Title 10, Chapter 204 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances related to food code. So who will be giving us our presentation today? All right. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Um, it'll be a tough act to follow here with green to go stuff, but uh, my name is Adam Kalahar. I'm an environmental health specialist with the city of Minneapolis. Uh, I do restaurant inspections along with pool and lodging inspections. Uh, as you may know, health inspectors are tasked with enforcement of many ordinances in the city, uh, be it green to go, staple foods, um, sick and safe time notification, uh, simply because in our role we visit most businesses throughout the city throughout the year. Um, I've also been involved in the amendment process of the Environmental Preservation Environmentally Acceptable Packaging Ordinance, commonly known as green to go And I'm here today to talk to you about some proposed changes to that ordinance. Um, green to go compliant packaging, um, which we require in the city, is either reusable, recyclable, or compostable. Uh, as the ordinance is currently written, Green to go compliant packaging shall be considered environmentally acceptable packaging only when the food establishment provides consumers with an opportunity to recycle and or compost that packaging. Uh, so this means that if there is no opportunity to recycle or compost for the consumer, the food establishment is in violation of the ordinance. And what these amendments are designed to do is reassign some responsibilities and also apply some common sense to the rule. Um, as the ordinance is currently written, each individual vendor is required to provide their own collection system at an organized event. Um, an event of 20 or 30 vendors, um, we're talking about six, potentially 60 collection bins sitting out there. Um, so with this part of the amendment, the event sponsor or market manager will now be responsible for providing a collection system located throughout the area. Um, this rule change will be reflected in the event food sponsor and market manager application, notifying them of their responsibility. Uh, so we see this as lifting the burden from, the burden from vendors um, to provide this service. Uh, the second part of the amendment, um, as the ordinance is currently written, all food establishments are required to have a front of the house collection system regardless of whether it's actually necessary or even feasible. Um, for example, um, with this um, exemptions that we are adding, we're going to lift requirements for um, sit down restaurants where servers remove the customers dishes and utensils. Um, we will no longer require collection bins at the front of the house. 
Um, that's part of the common sense um, things, I believe. <laughs> uh, uh, they still do need to provide green to go compliant packaging for things like doggy bags, just not the collection bins. And then also same thing will go for mobile food vehicles. Um, that's uh, your food trucks, hot dog carts, ice cream trucks. Um, they are not required to provide collection bins. Um, they will fall under this exemption as well. Um, but again, they will still need to have compliant packaging, just no bins. And that's pretty it, short and sweet. Great. Thank you, Adam. Do I have any questions or comments from my colleagues on the presentation? Great. All right. Thank you. Do we have any, if anybody is here to speak to this, uh, to this ordinance, please sign up with the clerk if you have not done so yet. Is there anyone interested in speaking on this item? Anyone? Anyone. All right. Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public, hear pub public hearing. Did I open it? I don't think I opened it. Okay, so I'm gonna open the public hearing. Seeing no one interested, you would like to speak to it. I have a question, is that okay? So if you're interested in asking a question, then you would have to talk to the staff directly, because the question would be directed to us, and we probably we might not have the answer. So able to answer your question? Not on the record, that would have to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. All right, seeing none, I'll. Now we'll close the public hearing and move approval of this item. Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to go ahead and move approval of it. Sorry, uh, I got excited. There. No worries, no worries. Um, it, you know, I just I really appreciate staff bringing forward these common sense changes to this. And I just want to give a shout out uh, to all the work that's gone on over the years that our staff have done specifically with the industry, with small businesses, to make sure that we're really achieving the goals of this. It's been just wonderful to see very hands-on, lots of education, lots of support. And I uh, couldn't be more appreciative of that. And I think that's why, as an ordinance green to go has been so successful, why other cities have looked at replicating it, uh, and why we haven't really had the, the pushback or, or negativity from the industry around it, because I think there has been such a hands-on approach and a, an effort to get to these uh, desired outcomes. And so I see that as just a progression of uh, this changes the progression of that work and just want to express my gratitude uh, to everyone uh, who's been worked, working on this over the years. Thanks. And thank you for your leadership on this. Are there any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Thank you so much. And now we are on our last item of the meeting, a public hearing on carry out bags in retail establishments ordinance. We have Patrick Hanlon here. The floor is yours. Chair Cunningham, council members, my name is Patrick Hanlon. I'm the director of environmental programs. Um, I'm here representing uh, the health department, public works, regulatory services, and community planning and economic development through the business licensing group on the bring your own bag ordinance. It's uh, amending title 11, chapter 225 of Minneapolis code of ordinances relating to health and sanitation, garbage and refuse. Uh, so the intent of this ordinance is to, uh, one, reduce litter. Um, you know, there's been uh, cleanups that go on, go on around the city, and in a recent cleanup, uh, over five tons of trash were picked up in two and a half hours, and if you look along the roadsides yourselves as you go around the city, much of that trash is uh, uh, plastic bags or carry-out bags. Uh, the second is to reduce waste, is to encourage resident, residents to bring their own bag uh, when shopping. Uh, Minnesotans throw away an estimated 87,000 tons of plastic bags each year, um, and uh, less than 5% of those bags are um, recycled. Um, and then the third is the impacts on recycling facilities. Uh, a number of these bags, they, when they uh, go through processing, they jam up um, the, the um, 
the facilities uh, for, for processing waste material and there's estimates that it can take sometimes up to four to six hours a day removing those plastic bags. So it's a maintenance issues at some of these facilities. And then number four is the life cycle of environmental impacts. Um, you know, whether you're talking about paper bags that have a high upfront environmental impact costs or you're talking about plastic bags um, that have, you know, that we see in our trash and litter around the city. And even as you look at some of the emerging uh, research that's going on out there with uh, microplastics and the breakdown of plastics and those getting into our air and water um, is the concerns over that. And so this fee is really adding a social cost to um, to the use of bags. It's a five cent five cent fee. Uh, the ordinance history was brought forward March 21st, 2016 for public hearing. Uh, in April 2016, it was approved by council and that was going to be effective in June of 2016. In May of 2016, there was a state jobs bill and part of that state jobs bill, there was a, a part of it that preempted cities from imposing uh, bans on the use of uh, on paper, plastic or reusable bags and that came into effect May 31st. So what we had passed was a ban so we had to come back to the uh, to the drawing table and we simplified the ordinance in August of 2017 um, to put a fee on uh, paper and plastic that came before city council. It was passed before uh, the subcommittee and that was brought before full council and then at that point it was brought back and uh, council had directed staff to go back and to do more outreach with small businesses and in residents in low income areas and impacts on low income residents. Uh, so the ordinance change, I kind of jumped the gun, but it's, it's a five cent fee charged to customers for any carry out bag, paper, plastic, compostable, reusable. The retailers keep that fee. It's not collected by the city, they keep that fee. Um, and then residents that are on recognized food assistance programs um, are exempt from having to pay that fee. Um, and then there's a number of proposed exemptions and that uh, a lot of these exemptions came through uh, ex extensive outreach uh, out in the community and with business associations and with different groups. Um, so it's uh, exemptions on produce, bulk goods, small item bags, uh, dine-in or carry-out, uh, so at restaurants um, uh, or food vending bags, uh, farmer's market bags, that was a uh, recently added one uh, from some of the outreach that we did. Uh, retail establishments, establishments that do not possess a point of sale system, so that don't have a cash register. Um, and then secondhand bags um, that are used um, for customers to, to reuse products through secondhand bags. Um, bags sold in packages containing multiple bags, so if you're selling bags, obviously you don't get another five cent fee charged on all of the bags that are in that package. Um, and then dry cleaning bags. Um, there's, no, there's no way to bring your own bag to a dry cleaner um, to take that home, so that's part of their business process, so they're exempt from that. Uh, and more proposed exemptions, uh, bags given out where there's no transaction taking place, um, food banks, other food assistance programs, um, personal belongings that are given out at hospitals, dental offices, places like that, uh, newspaper bags or door hanger bags, car dealerships, uh, car washes, um, so the garbage bags uh, for the vehicles at those locations, and then uh, litter uh, bags that are used for cleanup. So um, all of these exemptions came from extensive outreach that were done on this proposed amendment. The enforcement end of things, I'm going to speak for um, uh, business licensing here and they can, they can cut me off or, and, and reg services um, if I speak out of turn. But uh, for the first part of this, it's going to be um, this, if this passes, will go into effect January 1st. And then for the six, first six months, there's no fines. It's, uh, you know, this is going to be dealt with on, um, by people calling into 311 if they have complaints um, at both a licensed business or an unlicensed business. So if it's a licensed business, it would be business licensing responding to those. If it's unlicensed, it would be regulatory services responding to that. Um, and it would be, the first six months would be an educational uh, time period and so going out and talking about the, what the requirements are. And the requirements are uh, that they have to have a receipt that shows the number of bags uh, provided and the total amount of pass through. So to show on a transaction how they're accounting for that bag going through the transaction process. And then um, the retail establishments must have a shared uh, uh, share the number of bags distributed and the value of the fees upon request. So have an accounting system of how they're keeping track of how those bags are coming in and how they're keeping track of that. So this is some of the uh, community engagement that's uh, that's been done. Again, council asked us to come back and do extensive outreach and uh, we, as staff, as a collective staff, I think we feel we've done that. 
Uh, we've gone out to a number of business advisory groups, uh, emails to all business associations, um, Community Environmental Advisory Commission, that's the environmental uh, advisory group here in the city, Homegrown Minneapolis, Northern and Southern Green Zones, they deal with environmental justice issues here in Minneapolis, both in North Minneapolis and South Minneapolis, those are designated areas of environmental justice in Minneapolis. Um, the Waite House Little Earth Residents Association, uh, we've done some recent industry meetings and then uh, did a, a survey out to residents. Uh, in, in the survey that uh, went out to residents, uh, we had some pretty clear indications that, uh, f that folks were supportive of this uh, measure going forward, um, uh, such as uh, do you support efforts to reduce carryout bags? 85% um, of respondents uh, said yes to that. Are you, are you more likely to bring your own bag to the store if you're charged a five cent fee on each carryout bag? And 67% um, of uh, people were supportive of that. So if you can just look at these different graphs here, you can see that um, both being strongly supportive and, and supportive of this ordinance, uh, there's a lot of strong support going forward for this ordinance change amendment. And then, if this were to pass, um, we'd be doing a lot of communication and outreach on the back end. Um, you know, a lot, similar to uh, the work that's been done in environmental health, as what was just talked about with the Green to Go program. It's been very successful outreach and going out and working with uh, business establishments and how to comply with these rules. Um, and so we'd be doing uh, working with the communications department uh, on social media uh, press releases, on news bites, so getting out to your constituents, uh, press releases out to the general public, and then. And uh, other department spe specific outreach where they're having one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with uh, folks uh, through environmental health e-news so that goes directly out to the uh, folks in environmental health through the food lodging and pools program business advisory groups solid waste and recycling on recycling reminders and then uh, again for the first six months there's going to be a time period when uh, we'll go out and be talking in person uh, with folks about the requirements for this ordinance and that's all I had right now. I know you got some folks that want to uh, come up in the public hearing, but I can answer questions if you have them. Are there any questions related to the presentation? All right, not seeing any at this point. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now I'm going to open the public hearing. Uh, we currently have 12 uh, 11 folks signed up to speak. If um, you are interested in speaking, please sign up over with the clerk. And um, we have two minutes per person to speak. I will call three names at a time, so if you would please um, line up, that would be appreciated so we're able to get through the list. So first up, we have um, Becky, followed by Kathy Geist, with Lee Samuelson on deck. Welcome. Hello, my name is Becky Wardell Gartner. I live in the Lindhurst, Lindhurst neighborhood of Minneapolis. I'm a, a master water, Hennepin County master water steward. I'm a Hennepin County master recycler, and I'm a member of the Lindhurst Environmental Committee. I am passionate about waste, and I work constantly on it. But I wanted to share an experience I had with, with you this summer. I was in the little town of Port Colburn, Canada, buying my groceries. And as I went to check out, everyone in line had a reusable bag. And I commented on it. I said, you must have a fee or something like that. And they just rolled their eyes and they thought, well, you must be from the United States. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and uh, they pay a five cent fee and nobody was taking a plastic bag. I was so impressed. So, so, um, so anyway, I hope the city council will finally get this across the line. I know you've done it before, but I hope it finally can become, come to fruition. And um, I did have a conversation with Kowalski's on this, and Kowalski's does not support it, but they said they thought it was too much work at the register for their cashiers. But already the cashiers give credits. When I bring my bag, they already give me credits. And they didn't want, the second thing was he didn't want to um, make a profit on it, and I said, well, 
use the money to buy some compostable items. I was talking to them about compostable meat trays. So, so um, those were my comments. I just wanted to finish with a letter to the editor that I had published in the Star Tribune. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. you. Feel free to submit it to the public record. Thank you. Send thank it over you. to the clerk. Great. Thank you. Kathy Geist, followed by Lee Samson with uh, Tom Confield on deck. Hello, council members. Thanks for being here and for this opportunity. I did not intend to speak when I came here. I just was so excited this was happening. And then I saw the list and I thought, well, I'm going to give it a whirl. Um, so I teach environmental science and biology at Minneapolis Community and Technical College. And I've been teaching since 1998 there. And I've been um, thinking about this stuff, but also watching the impacts of increasing solid waste and the issues surrounding that, both on humans and the rest of life. And so it's kind of from that perspective that I come to speak today. Um, also, our knowledge has changed a whole lot in terms of what these impacts are. We know now about the impacts of waste on our aquatic systems, including freshwater systems and ocean. We know about the fact that oil products go into the manufacture of plastic, and we know a whole lot more about climate change. And it's an imminent issue, as you all know, that we need to be addressing now rather than tomorrow, <laughs> frankly. So um, I've also watched what it takes for people to make changes, including my students. And we do some activities about uh, solid waste inventory and things like that. And they come up with ways that they could reduce their waste. And a lot of times it has to do with reducing bags and plastic and all those kinds of things. So we know this stuff, and it, we know that it's hard for humans to make changes. But I'll tell you, money, including five cents, is a motivator for people to make these changes. And if we are truly concerned about the, the greater biodiversity on our planet right now at a time when so much is being threatened, it behooves us to do this. So I was so glad to hear that this was coming up again on your, on your agenda. Um, oh, that's good timing. Um, I, wa <laughs> I want to thank you for what you're doing about this. And it's been incredible to sit through this entire hearing today and hear everything that's happened. But I really, really hope that this can be a step in the right direction. One more quick thing. If there are countries, up, I promise you, Okay. there are countries all over the world and cities all over the world that are outlawing plastic bags, period. So, you know, we're just, we're getting into it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Lee, followed by Tom, and with Catherine Munquist on deck. <clears throat> yeah, Chair Cunningham, members of the committee, I say if we're serious about getting close to zero waste, then plastic bags are basically the low-hanging fruit. And we have seen measures of, of its this like imp implemented in Washington, D.C., where it had led to a 72% reduction in plastic bag litter. And I am someone who bikes around as my primary way of transport in the city. And I, so I see up close and personal uh, the um, plastic bags that are littering the place uh, all around as if there were tumbleweed blowing around and on the grassland, and but I, I often pick them up, having haunting thoughts about microplastics, and uh, I say the the ordinance change it, it will at least provide an incentive to stop and think about alternatives to single-use plastic bags rather than continuing the same habit with with no reflection. And when I had shopped at at Aldi last time, it it. Uh, that's the store that which has figured it out. And um, overall, the oil that is made from that, the oil that plastic is made from, it's not some that's going to last indefinitely and can't ex expect this status quo of plastic bags to continue indefinitely. And it's, it's going to have to change at, at some point. And, uh, and I think, uh, I'm pretty sure that the expense of potentially traveling outside of Minneapolis to do grocery shopping will 
outweigh whatever the the costs are of the of the bags and and uh, it, it, at least for myself this this often works pretty well for grocery shopping and thank you thank you Lee next up is Tom followed by Catherine with Kyle Samajima on deck is Tom Confield here all right Catherine Lundquist, followed by Kyle, with Kim Erickson on deck. Thank you so kindly. I'm going to be very brief. So this particular bag, I am a nurse, and I do a lot of home care. And just one client has about 2,000 of these bags in their basement, which someone will have to dispose of at some time. Um, it's from a generation, granted, but multiply that times the millions and millions of people in this country, all around the world, having these bags. Um, I think we should have a fee of 10 cents a bag. And I think that the additional five cents can increase the wages for the people who have to go around and pick up the trash in our city. I ambulated several blocks to come to this hearing today, and I cannot tell you how much I regret I did not have time to stop and pick up every single plastic bag and plastic water bottle on my journey here to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kyle, followed by Kim with Ashley Kennedy on deck. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, members of the committee. My name is Kyle Samajima, and I'm a resident of the Lindale neighborhood, um, current board chair of the neighborhood, um, and the executive director of nonprofit Minneapolis Climate Action. I'm here as Eighth a resident. Ward. What's that? Eighth Ward. Eighth Ward. Best ward in town. I'm sure there's competition for that. But anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I am here as a resident and the uh, director of Minneapolis Climate Action in full support of the Bring Your Own Bag Ordinance and believe that it addresses issues of equity, reducing pollution, and shifting our city away from single-use items that are causing human and environmental harm right here in our city and around the globe, um, especially to communities already vulnerable to and impacted by pollution and climate change. Plastic bags are made of natural gas and lobbied for extensively by the fossil fuel industry. Industry. Paper bags have a higher greenhouse gas emission footprint than plastic, so they are not the ultimate answer either. We will not recycle our way out of this problem as well. Only by reducing the use and eventually stopping the production of single-use bags can this crisis be addressed. But lobbying groups and companies claim recycling can solve this crisis to ensure their profit at the expense of people right now today. Less than 5% are recycled, and it costs more to recycle them than to make a new one from virgin material. And when plastic bags are recycled, they're not made into something to be used in again and again, but downcycled one time. And the city's own zero waste plan puts source reduction as its first and foremost priority in these issues, as well as the manufacturing and disposable of plastic bags, including when they're burned in our incinerator, um, affect not only wildlife and waterways, but humans, especially those already disproportionately affected by pollution and climate change. Um, a five cent fee on plastic bags that doesn't apply to those on EBT, WIC, or SNAP will still be cheaper than buying a plastic bag. I did the math. It's nine cents to buy one and five cents to pay for one at the store if you really need them. Can I have 20 more seconds since we joked around a little yes, bit? Yes, you can have Awesome. I, Thank I, you. I honestly thought that. So you can have a couple <laughs> Thank more you. seconds. Because Thank we, you. We, Thank we you. Um, businesses large and small that either have no bags for customers or charge for them are doing just fine. You look at Aldi, you look at the co-ops, places like Ikea and Costco. People can adapt. Their customers and cashiers have also figured out how to manage getting their goods home and figured out how to manage various customer interactions. Minneapolis Climate Action is actively working to educate people on the link between between conception, climate change, and single-use items, and have a reusable bag cooperative, so we are actively getting reusable bags made from upcycled fabric in the hands of people. And we've seen the business interests and arguments about this issue, um, and hope that you center citizen and public interest first and foremost. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next up, we have Kim, followed by Ashley Kennedy, with Chris Meyer on deck. Hi, I'm Kim Erickson. I represent Zero Waste West Metro. 
Zero Waste West Metro has an interest in this ordinance passing as it paves the way for surrounding cities to pass similar ordinances. We'd love to see Minneapolis continue to lead the environmental movement. The state of Minnesota needs this to pass. As you may already know, Minneapolis has passed a bag ban, but is exempt at state level before it got into effect. Last year, there was a bill presented to remove the ban to ban plastic bags, and Zero Waste West Metro had the opportunity to speak at the committee meeting. There were a few interesting arguments against this bill, one of which was a lengthy discussion about dog poop disposal. What in the, what in the world would pet owners do without a free grocery bag to dispose of poop? Rest assured, plastic poop bags will not be banned, nor will they be have an additional fee. As Zero Wasters, we've come up with a few options for reuse that most people probably already have in their home. You can use frozen fruit bags, chip bags, salad bags, cracker bags, cereal bags, paper bags, shipping bags, Amazon bags, bread bags, newspaper bags, tortilla bags, use Ziploc bags, apple bags, potato bags, bagel bags, carrot bags, produce bags. I think you get where I'm going with this. The fact that we are so attached to these huge grocery bags for picking up poop is absurd. What are we picking up poop from, the, from our pet elephants? These bags are much more appropriate to use. Another interesting argument brought up early in discussion was the fear of confusion on customers, implying that customers will not be intelligent enough to understand if they can shop in Minneapolis and having to pay for a bag. Customers understand this when they shop at Aldi's, Ikea, and Costco, and there is no confusion about this. Let me tell you, when you go to the checkout lane, people understand. Single-use bag vans and chargers are spreading quickly around the world. Kenya, the European Union, Australia, Canada, and many more. Washington, D.C., our capital, has now imposed a five-cent tax on plastic bags and saw an 85% reduction in plastic bags. San Francisco was the first city in the U.S. to completely ban plastic bags and place a 10-cent fee on paper and compostable. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Ashley, followed by Chris Meyer with Dan Vance on deck. Okay, hi, my name is Ashley. I'm also from Zero Waste West Metro. Uh, being a landlocked state like Minnesota, it's easy to feel far removed from the growing problem of ocean pollution. It's easy to forget that the Mississippi River, storm drains, and all the other water systems eventually lead to the ocean. Minnesota contains 92,000 miles of streams and rivers, which eventually lead to the ocean. The average disposable bag is used for only 12 minutes before being tossed out, and it takes over 500 years for plastic bags to break down. Microplastics have recently become a growing concern by scientists around the world. In 2017, it was found that 83% of water sources globally contain microplastics. The University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire research team even found microplastics in our very own Minnesota boundary waters. This year, a university in Scotland and the French National Center for Science Research found that microplastics are in the air, even in remote areas with little to no human activity. And this year, microplastics were found to be in human stool. Plastics are, become, are being consumed by animals and then passed up the food chain to human consumption. So why are scientists concerned about having microplastics in the water, air, and bodies? Plastic is an endocrine disruptor, which means it mimics natural hormones upon entering the body. Contact with endocrine disruptors can lead to cancers, fertility issues, learning problems, impaired immune function, early puberty, and then many more. As for paper bags, there are issues there as well, including the carbon footprint of creating an item designed for immediate disposal. We currently have an environmental situation where recycling is no longer the answer. We need to become a culture of reuse to change the current situation by slowing the use of raw materials for single-use items. I'd like to close with a quote by German chemist Michael Brongart. Re recycling is an aspirin, alleviating a rather large collective hangover. Okay, overconsumption. The best way to reduce an environmental impact is not to recycle more, but to produce and dispose of less. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next up we have Chris, followed by David with Julia Karan, Karan on deck. Welcome. My name is Chris Meyer. Uh, my address is 601 6th Street Southeast, and I'm the Park Commissioner for District 1. And a lot of the litter um, created by bags ends up in our parks and our waterways. So I wanted to come and ask you to support this initiative. In other cities that have passed similar bring your own bag ordinances, uh, they have substantially reduced the, the litter in their systems. Uh, Washington DC 
um, was one of the first cities to pass something similar to what you're considering today. And there, the, the, uh, a five cent fee uh, resulted in a reduction in consumption by between 50 and 70 percent. And they found a 72 percent reduction in the litter in their waterway systems. Uh, San Jose, California saw an 89 percent reduction uh, in plastics in, in, in their stormwater. Uh, so I, I want to ask you to, to support that and also to just consider what the alternatives are. Um, like for those who who might be against this, you know, I want to ask. So, um, if you don't support this, do you support the Herc and burning the trash there, um, which heavily disproportionately impacts um, low-income communities? Because at this latitude, uh, the wind flows north and east, so it disproportionately hits north and, and northeast Minneapolis. Uh, do you support more landfills, um, which? last for generations and create all kinds of problems with um, pollution leaching into the water systems nearby and create a lot more air pollution um, from the trucks that have to f travel further distances. I mean, I, I feel that this is one of the lowest hanging fruits uh, to move toward a zero waste society. Um, so we, we need to take this action. You have the opportunity uh, to reduce bag consumption by probably tens of millions of, of bags per year, and I hope you will take it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Next up, David, followed by Julia, with uh, Jamie Full on deck. Welcome. Good morning, Council members. Thank you for having us today. My name is David Vance. I'm uh, in the Wyndham Park neighborhood. I'm also a board member of Minneapolis Climate Action, a nonprofit. And I would just like to state today, or I'd like to challenge businesses who oppose this ordinance to look at it uh, not as an obstacle, but as an opportunity. An opportunity to better our community, an opportunity to educate our community, and an opportunity to help their bottom line, which I think this fee will. I know it change is difficult, but if you take the step to place a fee, on single-use bags and eventually an outright ban, I'm positive you will quickly realize this is a win for us all. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have Julia followed by Jamie with Megan Cole Sten, sorry, um, on deck. Welcome. Hi. I'm Julia Curran, I live in Ward 7, and um, I am hoping that this fee will be supported again. I testified with the last one. Um, paper and plastic is a trick question, like so many of our environmental questions. We know better, we know what to do, we know that it takes reuse, we know that our creative solutions of how to carry things home are there for any time, any, as broad as our brains can make them. I've carried watermelons home in a shirt when I suddenly was hungry after a run. Um, the shirt never was quite the same, but I didn't need a plastic bag, and it'll decompose much more easily than any plastic bag. I have used scarves and handkerchiefs and any number of things, and I've carried enough reusable bags that I've been able to hand them to neighbors who haven't had them, um, ones that I've gotten from the thrift store when I've gotten something. I, we know that the impacts of climate breakdown hit the most vulnerable amongst us first and worst. Um, we know that the people least responsible are already feeling it most, and we know that that's getting worse. We know that we need to do things differently in every part of our lives, and this is one first step that we can take. Um, it's not flashy and new. We wanna save everything flashy for Chair Cunningham's awesome jacket. Um, <laughs> and we can, hmm, I, I just said I feel so overdressed. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I'm usually I listen to things on the radio and I'm working on other things, but that is making my day. And that's, um, let's put resources into sparkly coats, not bags we use for five seconds. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Next up we have Jamie followed by Megan with Lori, uh, 
Paul Lynch on deck. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Cunningham, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity today. I'm Jamie Pohl, president of the Minnesota Grocers Association. We're the state trade association representing the food industry, and we've been around for 120 years. We have a wide variety of members within the city, including grocers and convenience stores. Our members are committed to the communities that they serve, and being a partner in the solutions is of the utmost importance. We have taken our leadership role in for recycling and reducing for years. Our voluntary plastic take-back programs recycle over 2 billion pounds annually. This is a program that we have executed for decades and is the only option for repurposing plastic products. We have several concerns. First, the competitive disadvantage created for Minneapolis businesses. We know that consumers will shop price. A recent study by the National Association of Convenience Stores stated 64% of consumers would drive five miles out of their way to save five cents. There are many cities with competitive brick and mortars in such close proximities. Moving a basket size to another city is com concerning. We don't want to force our front-end team members to become the bag police. This ordinance is a dramatic change, as our customers are accustomed to receiving their bags at checkout as a complimentary service. Just as a point of reference, a typical grocery store in Minneapolis is processing about 2 million transactions a week. We offer curbside home delivery, and many of our members have hot meal solutions, making them a grocerant. Where and how these fees are assessed concern us. We are tasked with implementing the food assistance programs for those in need. The system has been designed so benefit recipients do not have to identify themselves. They use their EBT card to pay for their basket when the funds come from SNAP, WIC, or the cash supplement. It's a seamless transaction. This ordinance would require customers to identify themselves as SNAP benefit users. This is also concerning. The last item is the legality of the city mandating a fee. According to state statute, no county, city, or other taxing authority shall increase a present fee or impose a new tax on sales or income. Is the fee actually a tax? The Minnesota Department of Revenue has yet to rule if the fee is taxable or non-taxable, so this still can leads to questions. I'd just like to say as an industry that serves and supports employees, many in Minneapolis, we greatly share the op op appreciate the opportunity to share today, and we're happy always to stand for questions and work with the council as we move forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Next up, we have Megan, followed by Lori, with Miriam Holsinger on deck. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, and thank you, Chair Cunningham and committee members. Um, and thank you to staff for your great work over many years. Um, my name is Megan Cool stennis a nine-year resident and community, community member in East Phillips neighborhood. I strongly support the Bring Your Own Bag Ordinance changes because we are in a climate emergency. I support it because of its goals and planned outcomes out of it that which become reduced resources and more reusable bags used in Minneapolis. <clears throat> Excuse me. This resource use from single-use carryout bags is causing all sorts of extraction from new resources that are impacting communities of color and low-income communities. Not only will some of the oil in line three be used for plastics, including plastic bags, but manufacturing as well as incineration are often lo lo located in low-income communities and communities of color. If you care about stopping the new Line 3 and or impacting our climate emergency, we must pass these ordinance changes. Additionally, plastic bags are often littered. That's been talked about a lot here. Um, in my neighborhood, it's, litter is not only a problem, but I no longer feel that I can pick up litter, at least not, without, not on a whim without gloves because of the threat of finding needles in or around bags and other litter. This is costing great cost to whomever picks up this litter, either the city or the risk of the residents in hopes of having cleaner streets and sidewalks for our kids and other residents to walk and play and be. If we care about our kids having clean places to play, we must pass these ordinance changes. Additionally, the point of this ordinance is not to charge for bags. The point is to have people bring reusable bags with them. However, not only bags only, not only cost resources, but they cost money. So something given out for free as part of a purchase at a store, but has far more impact than just carrying that or those items out of a store. I'm going to jump ahead. <laughs> Many communities have gone before Minneapolis and have made huge changes because of these ordinances. These are. There are many reasons for a city to make this change, and these are my reasons. I hope you realize your reasons and vote to support these important ordinance changes. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Next up is Lori, followed by Miriam with Josie on deck. Hi, Chair Cunningham, Vice Chair Jenkins, and Council members. Thank you for holding this hearing. 
and letting us speak. I'm with the Sierra Club. I'm the lead of the uh, Zero Waste Task Force, and we do support this ordinance. We think it would be a very effective way to reduce plastic and paper. Without a fee, um, plastic bags are just given out way too easily. At the grocery store, a lot of times in the name of customer service, clerks just bag or double bag things that don't need to be, and it's very hard to avoid them. You always have to be on guard to avoid getting a bag when you don't need it. Every bag, paper, plastic, and reusable has an environmental cost. Reusing a bag shrinks the cost with every use. And just as people are waking up to the fact that we have too much plastic in our environment, we are in the middle of a plastic boom over the, from the supply of um, ethane from fracked gas. The capacity of plastic is set to increase 33% by 2025, and the Chemical Council is investing $164 billion in 264 projects that will be completed by 2023. People who work or live near these petrochemical plants are paying the price for cheap plastic. There is a stretch of road in Louisiana that's 80 miles long and has 100 facilities in it that are next to schools and homes. They're paying a very high price. The EPA says that the air in that area is some of the most toxic in the country. We're living in the age of plastic. It's in the air we breathe, the water we drink, and we don't know the health impacts of that. We need to push back against the expansion and shrink the demand for plastic. We have great reusable bag options, and I've been using this for a long time. And when I used to go to the store, I would people would be a little suspicious on why, all right, why um, I'm bringing my own bag. But now I'm met with, thanks for bringing it. Where'd you get that? Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Miriam, followed by Josie, and that's the last on this list. If you are interested in speaking, please sign up with the clerk. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Miriam. I'm a Ward 12 resident, but I'm here on behalf of Eureka Recycling. Thank you so much for having this. So uh, Eureka Recycling is a local zero waste social enterprise. Uh, we're located in Northeast Minneapolis, and we are a huge fan of the Bring Your Own Bag Ordinance Amendment, which will require this five cent fee. This amendment will result in significant reduction in our use of resources and mitigate the negative environmental and human health impacts of disposal that is encouraged, um, that happens when residents don't bring their own bag to grocery and other retail stores. And while we're all impacted negatively by single use, plastic bag. At Eureka, um, we have found we're specifically impacted in our facility. Uh, earlier they mentioned four to six hours cleaning screens. That does happen every day that we, our staff have to spend. Um, this spring we did a study on really what were the impacts of plastic bags and I was astounded to realize uh, we estimate it costs about $75,000 per year in extra maintenance, staff, and disposal costs because of all the plastic bags that end up in the recycling uh, when we wish residents wouldn't put them in there in the first place. Um, additionally, someone mentioned the voluntary plastic bag recycling that happens at grocery stores. At Eureka Recycling, we talk with all of the end markets where we sell material, and so we have a good sense of what can be recycled and not recycled. And all of the plastic bag recyclers they speak with have more than enough material. So they're not looking for more plastic bags. So even though we only recycle about 5% of all the plastic bags that are currently generated, there's not enough places for the rest of them to go. So reduction really is our best option in this case. Uh, furthermore, this ordinance uses a demonstrated viable model that has proven to be effective at reducing bag usage. Many people have already mentioned the other cities where they've seen significant reduction when you add that small five cent fee. We've also seen that in our own city where several uh, businesses have instituted that fee. Uh, so I just want to continue and say thank you and we are really in support of this. Great, thank you so much. Next up, we have Josie. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm with the Zero Waste Group at Sierra Club. And um, I went for a, a walk a week ago. Um, I walked 12 blocks, which is about one mile in my neighborhood in Seward. And I collected this bag of trash in that amount of time, um, plastic. Uh, it's approximately one cubic foot for a 30 minute walk. Minneapolis has 2,137 miles of streets. So if, if 
my neighborhood is typical of the rest of Minneapolis. That would be 243 square feet or 81 yards of plastic for the rest of the city for a 12 minute walk. Um, or enough plastic to fill a 20 by 20 foot room up to our necks. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm uh, really for this um, five, you know, meager five cent um, fee. And I also want to acknowledge we're on Dakota land, which um, I look at that picture of the Mississippi and think of that and just think, you know, what a travesty, especially in light of that and, and how that culture back then that we, you know, we stole in their land um, would, ne would be just, you know, so appalled at the um, violence we're really doing to the earth, partly through plastic. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. Is there anybody else interested in speaking? Anyone? Anyone? All right, not seeing anyone else, I will go ahead and close the public hearing and open it up if there's questions or comments from my colleagues. Councilmember Gordon. Yeah, I'm happy to move approval. I really appreciate everybody who came to speak today. Um, certainly, as most folks know, this is something I've been working on for quite a while. Um, and working with others on for quite a while, and I think it's gonna be a real positive step for the city. I think that the city is also committed to working with our local businesses to see that they can't be successful implementing this. I certainly know people who will um, walk many blocks or drive many miles to come to one of the uh, co-ops or places that isn't distributing bags or go to their Aldi's because they like that store, so I think there's a way to attract customers to, to the stores and be successful. Um, and we will certainly be working in the, the weeks ahead to do that. And I'm um, hoping that one thing that we can do um, to make sure that there isn't some kind of um, uncompetitive advantage if we happen to be on the borderline with some suburb and some other store is that we can go together to the state legislature next year and we can say make this statewide so that it's a fair playing field throughout all of Minnesota. And I make that commitment to go with you. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank Councilmember Gordon for his leadership on this. I support the ordinance. I think it was really helpful to hear from Miriam at uh, Eureka Recycling about the costs associated with this. I think we got to keep getting that out there and let people know there is a cost to this. These bags are not free, and every time you take one, others are paying that cost. And so this is really about fairness. This is about equity. This is about really letting uh, the market get back in balance by correcting a negative externality and having people pay ultimately for the costs associated with these bags. Um, in that regard, I'd say, uh, and again, I support this ordinance, my only regret about this is that the state does not give us the authority to take part of that fee and be able to dedicate it to actual environmental cleanup. There is so much litter out there that's clogging our streams, our rivers, our storm drains, there's a cost for the city from an infrastructure standpoint, there's a cost to the environment, to wildlife, and it's uh, a shame that we don't have that ability yet. I agree with my colleague, Councilmember Gordon, that we want uh, to keep our work going at the state level and hopefully get some changes in legislation that would then allow us to uh, pick up that end of things as well, because we don't want that uh, cost to continue to go unpaid for. Um, and just on a, uh, ending on a silly note, I guess, uh, I appreciated Kim's point as well about uh, dogs. We hear about that a lot. I have a very small dog, and so the concept of using a very large uh, bag seems kind of uh, ludicrous to me. And they make these great little tiny compostable bags as well they sure uh, do. for dogs, and so it works out really well. Um, but it's it's been great, and I, I know Councilmember Gordon really um, inspired our family to make the change to carry out bags when he initially brought up this legislation as well. And it's, it's a lot easier than people think, and it's, uh, it's a positive change overall. Thank you. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. Um, I too want to uh, commend my colleague, Councilmember Gordon, for um, steadfastly champion this issue um, over several years now um, and I will be supporting this measure on a less silly but certainly um, I would say a shameless plug note 
Um, as some of you may or may not know, I'm also an artist, and I have an exhibition up at the Corner Store Gallery right now called Bag Lady Manifesto, and it is a um, art ex exhibition that is made up entirely of recycled bags, and so you can go and view that exhibition um, until this coming Friday, I believe. It's coming down, but it's the Corner Store Gallery in uh, Northeast Minneapolis, and the address is, oh boy, let's see here. Not available. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Corner okay. Store Gallery, Northeast Minneapolis. Great, thank you. All right, I'll go ahead and just add that um, I am particularly excited hearing the data around the decrease in litter um, as a result of this. Um, I live and represent North Minneapolis, and we have it, our littering issues are truly atrocious. Um, and so I think that anything that we're able to do in order to be able to curb that, I think is really important. Um, and I have a bunch of dogs, so I feel like I have to also speak to it. I think that we should be having conversations about why are we putting the most compostable thing into something that is not compostable and break down? Like, so um, just throwing that out there that uh, there are compostable bags. And um, so if that is an issue, folks should take that into consideration. Um, great. So we have a motion on the floor for approval um, of this item. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and that item carries. Thank you, colleagues, and everyone for being a part of this conversation. And with no further business before the committee, this committee is adjourned.